we'll uh, await the full assemblage of the board up here. Uh, anyway, good evening and uh, thanks for coming. My name is Peter Conlon. I'm the chair of the board and very uh, briefly acting as moderator to call the meeting to order. Uh, so, the legal voters of the Addison Central School District are hereby warned to meet at the Middlebury Dean High School in Middlebury, Vermont on Tuesday, February 26, 2019 at 7 p.m. to transact the following business. Article 1, to elect the following officers, moderator, treasurer, and clerk. So I would begin by asking if there are any nominations for the position of moderator. Nominee Jim Douglas. We have a, uh, one nomination uh, for Jim Douglas as moderator. Are there any other nominations? Here. Oh, I'm just going to say I move they be closed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, not hearing any other uh, nominations, I would uh, put the vote to the members of the district. All those in favor of electing Jim Douglas as moderator, please say aye. 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 One opposed? And that ends my duties as moderator. Congratulations. <laughs> Great job. You'll get your, you'll get your pension, Peter. <laughs> Are we using this or not? I guess not. Even though the light comes on. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you all for, for being here tonight in our new venue. Everyone found it, at least so far. Uh, Linda will be on the prowl for any other voters uh, wandering through the hallways of the high school to make sure they find the right, the right venue. <coughs> Our next uh, uh, responsibility under Article 1 is to elect a treasurer for the district. Is there a nomination for the Office of Treasurer? I nominate Michelle Warren. Michelle Warren is nominated. Uh, is there a second to that nomination? Second. Seconded. Uh, many. Any other nominations? If not, anyone would like to make a motion to close nominations and cast a single ballot for Michelle? Can uh, Michelle Warren stand up so I know who she's behind? She's behind you? On the <laughs> <laughs> Michelle, thanks. Good. Nominations closed. Motion from Suzanne to uh, close nominations and cast a single ballot for Michelle. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second. Ready for that question? If so, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and you've elected Michelle <coughs> as our treasurer. We now turn to the election of a district clerk. Is there a nomination for that position? Uh, I would nominate Linda Barrett as district clerk. The Barrett's nominated. Is there a second to that nomination? Any other nominations for the office of clerk? Not. Is there a motion to cast a single ballot for Linda for the position of clerk? So moved. So. Moved and seconded. Ready for that question? So all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. You've elected Linda to serve again as our clerk. Article 2, to hear and act upon the reports of the school district officers. Of course, uh, following the formal meeting, there will be a presentation by the administration and board with respect to the um, budget. Um, but uh, are there any uh, questions of the officers or directors of our district on the reports that they've submitted? Discussion on them? Now, is there a motion to accept the reports of the district treasurers and uh, district <coughs> officers as presented? So moved. Natalie moves that they be accepted. Is there a second? Oh, second. they shouldn't be the ones who have submitted them, so <laughs> thank you. Any discussion? Not all in favor of accepting their reports signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it. We've accepted the school district officer reports. <coughs> Article 3 to see if the voters of the Addison Central School District will vote to authorize its Board of Directors under 16 BSA Section 562, Subsection 9, to borrow money by issuance of bonds or notes not in excess of anticipated revenue for the school year. What's your pleasure regarding Article 3? So moved. Chip moves adoption of the article. Seconded. Any discussion? 
on Article 3? How much was, um, how many, how, how much was issued this year? Uh, are you talking about bonding? Well, how much, what TAN did you actually use? You're allowed to do it. What did you do? Did we, did we uh, do any borrowing or issuing the bonds? Yeah, well, we, we borrow every year before we get paid by the state. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah. I mean, is it basically this, it's the same numbers you've been using? And how much is it? Brittany's exactly. looking it up. Mm -hmm. Our line of credit this year is just over four million dollars. Didn't we use that? No, um, I think that we've used. I'd have to look at what we've actually used this year, but we've already repaid it. But if you give me one moment, I can I can find it. Discussion under this article. I presume we want the answer to this question before we act on it. So, uh, anything else, Chair? This is, a, this is on every. This is on every uh, uh, morning every year because we have to borrow money in order to pay salary before we get the taxes. How much? Yep. It, was, it was a million three that we borrowed this year. It's already been repaid. Okay. So, one point three million borrowed within the year in anticipation of the uh, revenues from the state, presumably. Yes. Perhaps tax receipts, I'm not sure. Yes. What's the relevance of your question? How much this might cost the district? We're, we're agreeing to spend money. Yeah, so it, it doesn't have much net effect because it's just in anticipation of revenues that we've already voted. There's a small, small interest charge. Very small. And we pay the note back as soon as we get our first tax payments. Thank you. Any other discussion on Article 3? If not, are you ready for the question? So all in favor of adopting Article 3, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no? The ayes have it, and you've adopted Article 3. Article 4, to do any other business proper to come before said meeting. Any other business? Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much. Um, as our as our board grows uh, a little bit uh, older in our in our infancy, we uh, have gotten to the point of where we have to say goodbye to some board members. Um, this year, Perry Hansen at the end of the table there, and being an introvert, he hates the fact that I'm going to point him out. Uh, <laughs> is re is retiring. Um, Perry's one of our founding members of the ACSD board, but of course served in Ripton for many years before that. Uh, he's been an integral uh, part of our discussions on the board and um, has really headed up our um, policy discussions uh, as chair of our policy committee. Um, and just uh, on a board level, uh, what we really appreciate about Perry is that he asks a lot of provocative questions, um, challenges us on, on certain assumptions we might make, um, but does it in a, uh, in a very friendly and a nice way. Um, but what's been great is that it's very clear that Perry, for the years he's been with us, has enjoyed the work and that he believes in our mission. And um, that's really a great combination to have. So for his troubles, he gets a piece of paper that reads, in grateful appreciation to Perry Hansen, school board director, for his dedicated service to the students, staff, and communities of the Ripton Elementary School and the Addison Central School District. And Perry, with great appreciation, I pass this off to you.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Perry, thanks so much for your uh, dedicated service. We're grateful. Thank you. Any other business to come before the annual meeting? Not is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Moved and seconded. All in favor of adjourning the annual meeting, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The ayes have it, and we've adjourned. It's a recess. Too much. Sorry? It's a recess till the voting on March. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and that leads us right into our public information hearing, which immediately follows the adjournment of the annual meeting. And um, warning for that is the legal voters of the Addison Central School District are hereby warned to meet at the Middlebury Union High School in Middlebury, Vermont on Tuesday, February 26, 2019 at 7 p.m. for a public information meeting to discuss Australian ballot articles warned for a vote on Tuesday, March 5th, 2019. And those are uh, three. They're on the next page of the warning, uh, along with the location and hours of the uh, polling places. First is Article 1, shall the voters of the Addison Central School District vote to authorize the ACSD school board <coughs> to expend $37,794,916 which is the amount the ACSD school board has determined to be necessary for the ensuing fiscal year. It's estimated that this proposed budget, if approved, will result in education spending of $17,473,000 uh, they floated up a little in recent years. $17,473.81 per equalized pupil. This projected spending per equalized pupil is 3.35% higher and spending for the current year. Article 2, shall the voters of the Addison Central School District vote to authorize the ACSD School Board to appropriate $123,801 of the FY 2018 unassigned <coughs> fund balance estimated at that amount, $123,801, to the ACSD Capital Reserve Fund. The third article is to elect five school directors, three from Middlebury, one from Ripton, and one from Weybridge. So I'll invite uh, uh, our chairman, Peter Conlon, to uh, begin the discussion, the presentation on the budget, which is Article 1, and uh, Article 2, of course, is uh, uh, a uh, piece of that as well. And uh, then we'll hear from the administration and, and see what questions uh, you might have. Peter. Thanks. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be quite brief because um, those with the in-depth knowledge of the budget uh, are better off presenting it. Uh, but just to say that the, the budget process for the board this year um, uh, was a little smoother than last year, um, largely because I think you'll find that, that there aren't a lot of uh, radical changes in it. Um, the board felt that we've got a lot of long-term thinking going on um, with our master, uh, our facilities master plan, uh, but as well as we really, through the hard work of last year and some of the hard decisions that were made, we sort of set ourselves up this year um, to be in a, in a more level place. And I think you'll see that reflected in the budget that the administration um, presents. Um, and I think I would just comment further that uh, as we sort of have been doing the budget on a, on a parallel track, we have been working, and this has really been consuming a lot of our, our public interest time, and that is working on this facilities master plan, really taking a long-term view um, of where we are today, where we see the district should be in the future, and trying to create a roadmap to get there. Uh, there's gonna be more of that coming up um, in uh, April, May, um, as the spring unfolds, uh, there'll be another series of, of public meetings on it. Um, and I know that's not the focus of tonight's hearing, but I just wanted to uh, put that out there. Uh, and in the meantime, turn it over to the superintendent and business manager to give us a more in-depth look at, at the um, school budget, as proposed. Thank you, Peter. We're, we're taking the heat down to 50 at night. This is one of our cost cutting measures. Um, starting to jack it. So um, thank you everyone for being here. And um, we're gonna kind of go through the budget book, which um, some of you collected. It is online as well. If you weren't able to find it, it's under departments and finance. 
So if you look under finance, the budget book and annual report sits in that place on one of the drop down tabs. Um, if you want to get an electronic copy and, and read it on your um, computer. Um, I think as Peter mentioned, this year looks markedly different in terms of both the budget process that we're going through, our approach, um, and I think our vision too in terms of what we hope to accomplish in FY20. Um, just to kind of go back to last year at this time, we were dealing with a couple different things. One, um, Governor Scott at that point had talked about level funded budgets with school districts across Vermont. There was a lot of pressure. We didn't know what the impact would be of state legislation on our budgets. We spent a lot of time wondering and kind of trying to figure out where we should land. Uh, we started that budget process last year trying to level fund. We did accomplish that. Um, we also have been dealing with declining enrollment for a number of years. And we've got some graphs, and I think Brittany's going to talk about a little, that a little bit when she um, discusses the FY20 budget. Um, the, the changes that we made last year in FY19 budget allowed us to absorb losses in equalized pupils this year. Um, for those of you that don't know what that term equalized pupil means, it's, it's what you see in, in the um, warning here. It's how we are funded and it's a two-year average student count. And it, it weights students differently. So a pre-K student is counted at 0.46. Um, an elementary student is 1.0. We have additional weighting for secondary students, additional weighting for ELL, and there's also um, additional weighting in a different way for students living in poverty. Um, so it's, a, it's a kind of a complex number. It's hard to, for us to project what that's going to be, but that is the number that we're looking at that we talk about as we're doing these budget presentations because that's what the state is using to fund education for us here. Peter mentioned the facilities master planning process and the board working to establish a long range vision for ACSD. And we realized in building the budget this year that one of, one of the objectives should be to not make drastic changes, to not try to move this direction and this direction, but really try to steer a steady course this year. And, and that, that is, I think, what this budget represents. Um, it's mostly, um, I, I think at a high altitude, it's mostly a rollover. We have made some slight changes um, where necessary and where appropriate, um, but generally it looks more or less like how we're living and how we're teaching and learning right now in ACSD, looking ahead to FY20. Um, we are also continuing to um, both support our International Baccalaureate Development, um, next year is the, the beginning of the diploma program at the high school, which is really exciting. Um, we are in the authorization process right now. We have visits coming um, from IB in the next um, month, and we'll be starting those classes in um, September, which is super exciting. So, the, so supporting that work and supporting the work we're doing um, for social emotional learning and support systems within that IV framework are also included in the budget. Um, the facilities master plan is, um, as we think about the budgeting process, the reason I put this slide up because I wanted to talk a little bit about just how important this long range visioning is. And as I've reflected on all of the budgets that I've been a part of in my six years here, uh, both in individual school budgets and in now the unified budgets, one thing that I've noticed is that we do a lot of reaction to events that happen, but we don't do a lot of proactive planning about what we want to see happening in the future. And that takes more than one year. It takes multiple years to be able to establish a vision and work towards it. And one of the benefits that I've experienced from my vantage point and my experience here is that with a new board and with a unified board that has, that's working together across many communities, which is now one community as opposed to a multiple, ACSD is a new community, 
Um, it's enabling us to think a little bit differently about budgeting. So I think we are also, as a district, we're in the, the kind of the nascent stages of thinking about budgeting differently than we did in the past when a boiler broke and we ran around and tried to put some band-aids on it to fix it because fixing that was gonna be a significant impact if our numbers were just this close to the excess spending threshold and we knew there would be a tax penalty. So we're, we're trying to think ahead to make decisions that are going to support us really getting to where we want to go and not being in that reactive stage. So that's, that's kind of some of the philosophy of how we're trying to start thinking about budgeting, uh, which I think will pay dividends for students for in way, way into the future. Brittany. Brittany, would you introduce yourself for everybody? Yes. I think maybe over here is good. Okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. My name is Brittany Gilman, and I'm the business manager for the school district. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the mechanics of the budget, the way that the funding uh, formula works in Vermont, and we want to do that in a way that's similar to how it's laid out in the budget book and annual report. So the beginning of the budget book and annual report is more of a narrative which sets the stage for the budget. So in the early stages of the budget, uh, when we don't know much about what the legislature might propose or uh, what the governor might propose, we're looking at our environment. And that environment becomes more clear throughout the budgeting process. So this is, you know, this is our springboard. Wages and benefits account for approximately 75% of the ACSD budget. So we did see a significant savings, as Peter mentioned, from early retirements in FY18, which meant that our FY19 wages were under what was budgeted, which put us in a better position when we started out budgeting for FY20, which was fortunate because we are seeing a health insurance premium increase of 11%, which is pretty substantial. We also have to consider our contracts that we have. So we have contracts for transportation. Uh, we have contracts for physical therapy and occupational therapy services with counseling, um, counseling service of Addison County. So we need to take any natural increases for those into account. We have an equalized pupil decrease, which I'll talk about at length um, a little bit more. That's part of the funding formula. The property yield is also part of the funding formula, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, that's a proposed increase, which actually helps the tax rate and our incentive rate. So you might recall from prior years that ACSD received an incentive rate for unifying. So that started at 10 cents, then 8 cents. For FY20, it will be 6 cents, then 4, then 2. So that factors into the tax rate as well. Peter also mentioned that we're seeing declining enrollment. This is a reality for school districts across Vermont, excluding Chittenden County. So from the current year to FY20, there's a loss of approximately 26 equalized pupils. And this, I know it's a little bit hard to see up here. Um, this has been talked about a bit in some of the facilities master plan sessions. This is a forecast of our enrollment through 2026. So the beginning is 2008, which was over 1,850 students. By the time we get to 2026, we're looking at below 1,650 students. So part of the challenge long term is figuring out how do we respond to that. So the next part of the budget book really gets more into the financial piece. So we talk about cost centers in the budget book a lot. So the cost centers are sort of large functional areas, ways that we break out costs, student instruction, special education, technology, facilities, these are all sort of large areas where we categorize costs. So first, before we talk about expenditures, we'll talk about revenue. So there's four main types of revenue that go into our budget, local, state, federal, and what we call other, which means that doesn't fall into one of the other categories. So primarily our local revenues include tuition revenues, which we're seeing uh, about $180,000 projected increase and our special education excess cost billing, which is a, about a $150,000 increase. So this is pretty substantial and helped offset some of the expenditure increases that we saw. Special education excess cost billing uh, is related to students that are tuitioning into our district receiving services. We are able to bill their sending districts for those services. And we did see an increase in tuition revenue, uh, a greater number of students this year. 
Uh, some of this was because of the closure of uh, Rochester Hill and High School, so we saw some of those students coming here. Our state revenue primarily includes special education reimbursement and block grants. So we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about special education expenditures, but every dollar of special education spending has some form of reimbursement. Um, and sometimes that's 100% reimbursed, sometimes it's more like 50%, um, and it also includes state grants. And another area that I wanted to highlight is the healthcare recapture. So this might sound familiar uh, from, from the prior two years, but essentially there was a bill passed in the legislature that uh, savings to new, that from moving to new healthcare plans, school districts all moved to new healthcare plans. There were some savings from that, and there was the idea to recapture some of that savings at the state level. So essentially, we were shorted $166,000 in our education spending grant this year. That's not in place next year, so that helped us. That's an automatic $166,000 that we're going to get that we weren't getting this year. Our federal funds include federal grants and reimbursements. So most commonly, you, were, you would hear these referred to as Title I, Title IIA, Idea B. Those are the big ones. And then in the other category, we have Medicaid reimbursements and private grants and trusts. So most of the state, federal, and other expenditures are cost neutral. So really what we're looking at is how our local revenue offsets our local costs. On the expenditure side, our largest area of spending is student instruction, regular education student instruction. And this includes classroom instruction and all associated support services located within each school cost center, so within each school. And it also includes shared personnel and materials that are district-wide. So some examples of this would be English language learner teachers. There are also shared personnel among the rural schools, nurses, guidance. Their supplies are included here. The major driver here is wages and benefits. We already talked about the health insurance premium increase and 64, over 64% of the student instruction cost center is dedicated solely to K-12 instructional programs. And you can see that breakdown here. So that big blue portion is instructional programs, K-12. Some other areas include athletics and co-curricular, principal's office, instructional support, instructional support is paraeducators, guidance, nurse, and custodial, transportation, and local support for food service operations. Our second biggest cost center is special education. As I said, that's partially or fully reimbursed by state or federal government revenues, depending on the expense type. So what's included in this cost center is special education teachers, paraeducators, psychological services, OT and PT, transportation specifically related to special education students and other related support <coughs> services. One thing to highlight is that this year there's a new leadership model. We have building-based special education coordinators, one for elementary and one for secondary, and the goal of these positions is to aid in the implementation and coordination of special education services district-wide and provide, and, you know, excuse me, enabling our educators to provide support to students. So I'm going to continue to highlight just a few of the cost centers. I tried to pick the biggest ones um, to give you more information about. So we have a centralized facilities department, and this includes staff working together to try and create preventative maintenance schedules, repairs, and also larger scale capital projects as needed. And this is where the facilities expenditures go. So it's more evenly divided, uh, a relatively small portion towards salaries and benefits, 13%. You can see that most of it is utilities, so these are somewhat fixed, electricity, fuel, natural gas. Uh, there's also about 16% for repair and maintenance. And this includes the local portion of spending. It doesn't include our capital projects fund, which is uh, funded through transfers of prior year fund balance. Our transportation cost center includes transportation services to and from school. That's our biggest transportation cost. There are also field trip expenses, which are accounted for in student instruction, and special education transportation needs that are accounted for in the special education cost center. So this chart shows our five-year transportation contract. As you can see, we're slated for um, an increase over time. 
So part of what we're doing is examining efficiencies, determining um, if we're using the most efficient routes, um, and trying to find ways to, to make it as cost effective as possible. So we're in process of doing that so we can try to minimize that projected effect. We also have a centralized technology department and we're in the middle of a digital learning plan which you can find information about on our website if you're interested. And that spans through 2020. So as part of that, we're developing replacement cycles, we're evaluating our inventory, and we're examining all our current software and our current hardware, any leases that we have, to make sure that what we're doing is working for students and that's the most efficient and cost effective. And here's our spending for technology. So this is about 47. Right. Right, maybe, do you want to pause for questions or, or wait till the um, end? Sure. Under technology, how much are you spending on security? So security would fall under facilities. That wouldn't fall under technology. Um, no. Technology. Oh, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. Um, I don't know that number, but I can I can look at that. And I hope it's big. <laughs> yeah. So just because we're in the rural areas doesn't mean we don't get hacked. Certainly not. Yes, yeah. and I know there is a concern about that. So we do have firewalls. We do have those things in place for our servers. Um, I, but I, don't I could add a little bit to that. Yeah, I don't so, know the number. So we, we um, there's a consortium that started in Vermont to increase our level of preparedness, especially for school districts, because that's been an issue over the last year across the country. I don't, you've probably seen it in the papers with ransom for taking student data, for example. Uh, so, because school districts increasingly are adding on software providers for programs and things like that. Um, without a lot of over, or there hasn't been previously a lot of oversight. So we have taken, um, we're, I think we're one of the lead institutions in Vermont to work with a Vermont consortium, I think led through the AOE to require all software providers to sign a certificate or a contract basically with us to, to, to pretty much guarantee that one, the, the data will be held in a certain way, and then when we exterminate or we, we terminate the contract with them, that we get that data back, and it doesn't just sit somewhere. Um, and so, and there's a, bit, there's a long vetting process for that. So we're definitely aware of that, and, and I think our technology director, Will Hatch, is, is at the front end of, of the work that's happening in Vermont on that, but definitely really important. Do you do security audits? What do you mean by security of, of our yeah, software or uh, tracking in, incoming requests for data and so forth? I, I think we're con we're constantly doing those kinds of audits to to see that, that our network is is safe that you know the firewalls are working the way they should, um, but things are changing daily too. I mean, we're finding yeah, phishing, for example, has gotten really complex. Um, you know, we, we had recently someone taking over someone's email and impersonating that person and then writing other people in the building. So, so there are people that are looking on our website and are, are understanding who is in our school. So it, we, we're, we're very aware of that. We're um, talking about it a lot. Our tech department is sending information to all faculty, telling them, you know, both as things are occurring and also best practice as well. So. It's, it's certainly a, a concern that we're aware of and, and working on. I apologize, I didn't understand your question. Uh, uh, facilities, I have to mention, are you doing solar? Have you considered solar? I notice a fifth to a quarter of the budget is electricity. Is there any solar incorporated in what you do? Are you considering it or when? So we, we have a few different solar arrays in, in a few of our schools. Um, in terms of long term, that what I was yeah. talking about earlier, looking ahead, yeah. I think the intention of the board is to is yeah. to to do that, but they want to get through this facilities master planning process first to set that vision. I think that solar and alternative energy would be part of what the outgrowth of the master plan. Theoretically, there will be large scale things you could buy into. Definitely. For example, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot. Of your budget is yeah. electricity, that's huge. Yeah. And we do, um, the three Middlebury schools are, um, do, do have natural gas capabilities. So that's been a more recent upgrade. 
Uh, in technology also includes our internet service and our, and our copy releases, as well as equipment, Chromebooks, printers, things like that. So I wanted to talk a little bit about our reserves. We have three <coughs> reserves that were voted on by the taxpayers to, to be established. We have an education reserve. You can see the balance there. It's just over $850,000. We have a health care reserve, and this was created at the same time that we were transitioning to a brand new health insurance plan design for all school employees, and this was a statewide shift. And as part of that, there was a new model called a health reimbursement account, and it was based on um, usage. So it was a little unclear how much we could expect people to use. So in order to protect against some of that uncertainty and not having data um, to, to rely on or trends, <coughs> there, the fund was established with $200,000. $200, so beginning in FY21, the state of Vermont will be taking over all negotiations for healthcare for all school employees. So the board plans to transfer these funds to the Ed Reserve to ensure that they are used for ACSD, they stay with ACSD. And we also have the capital reserve fund, and that's being used this year, so that's why I'm saying approximately $200,000. We're projecting that that would be the balance at the end of the year. And you'll see when we get to the warning that there is a special article warrant to transfer our FY18 unassigned fund balance to our capital reserve to fund future capital projects. So I wanted to go through the tax rate calculation and explain a little bit about how the funding mechanism in the state of Vermont works. Uh, it's, it's a little complex um, and involved, there's a lot of moving pieces and there's a lot that we're not in control of. So we start with our total expenditures. The total expenditures is just how it sounds. It's everything in our budget. That number includes the specially worn article which is why it's slightly different than what you see in the warning. We have to warn those two items separately, our regular expenditures and any transfers to reserve. You uh, subtract your revenues and you get education spending. So our education spending is a 1.9% increase. And that's essentially where our control ends. Everything else sort of becomes um, just a mechanism of the funding formula. Next, we have our equalized pupils, uh, which Peter mentioned is, um, it's not a one-to-one -one for students, but it's a two-year average, it's a weighted average, and the idea is to create an average student in terms of cost. So that's a 1.41% decrease, which is how we get to our education spending for equalized pupil increase of 3.35%. That's also a number that you'll see on the warning. We're required to warn our total expenditures, our education spending for equalized pupil, and the change from the current year. Next is the property yield. This is recommended by the tax commissioner and it's set by the legislature, um, usually in the spring. So it is subject to change, but any increases in the property yield are good for the tax rate uh, because we divide our ed spending for equalized pupil by the property yield to get our equalized tax rate. Typically, this is where the district tax rate would end. But because we have an incentive rate as a result of unification, we have to deduct the six cent incentive rate to get our revised ACSD tax rate. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, no, 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 no. We don't want to restart either. I guess I have to hit confirm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's cross our fingers. <laughs> and that brings yeah, us down. <laughs> that brings you, you, no good options. Okay. <laughs> that brings us down to our revised ACSD tax rate of 1.5783. So if you're thinking in terms of two decimal places, which is how I think about um, tax rates, and most people do, it's about $1.58. And that's a 0.25% increase over the current year. Now, if you'll note, every town in the district has this same district tax rate, okay? So everyone's in the same place to start. Then we have to take into account the CLA. So the CLA is what causes Bridport to have a different tax rate than Cornwall, than Middlebury. Um, the CLA is, has to do with uh, property values um, in your town. What does it stand for? Common level of appraisal. And, excuse me, I'm sorry that the, that the Weybridge number got a little off filter there in the presentation, but you can see we all start out the same, and then divide the ACSD tax rate by the CLA to get your estimated town tax rate. 
and I have your estimated town tax rates there as well as your F-2019 actual tax rates. So when your CLA is greater than 100, it reduces your tax rate from the district tax rate. When it's below 100, it's an increase from the district tax rate. And changes in your CLA year over year can make significant differences in your tax rate, despite or in spite of whatever the district might do. So I have a few asterisks here. So for Cornwall, I do want to note that this is different than what's in the budget book. We just recently today have received some updated information. So the Cornwall CLA is in the process of being recalculated as a result of a petition for redetermination. So for estimation purposes, we'll assume a CLA of 100%, which means that the town tax rate is equivalent to the ACSD tax rate. Middlebury is in a similar situation. Middlebury is undergoing a reappraisal, and that will be completed in April of 2019. Mm -hmm. So the goal um, of reappraisal 100 is the uh, means that your your property values are um, where they should be. Yes, exactly <laughs> where they should be. So we're assuming 100 um, percent right now. The Middlebury CLA is in the 80s, so that would make the district tax rate equivalent to the Middlebury tax rate. Um, and you can see some of the tech report, for example, uh, potentially excuse me, uh, Ripton and uh, Middlebury would be seeing decreases. Some towns like Salisbury uh, and Weybridge are virtually the same and then slight increases in Cornwall and Shoreham. And this uh, is, in the, it is in the budget book as, and I think it was also on the summary sheet that they were given. So, in FY19, 34% of ACSD's education spending was funded by homestead taxes. About 45% was non-residential taxes, and that's considered a statewide revenue. So we have a statewide funding system. And 20% was additional funding through the statewide funding system. So I also want to show you how this might work out practically. Um, I always have to make a disclaimer that every homeowner is in a different situation, everyone's property value is different, everyone's income is different, but this is just an example, <coughs> excuse me, of how this could um, play out practically. So let's assume that we have a middle barrier resident with a $200,000 home value. Um, you take the homestead tax rate of 1.578.3, and then you have the, the home value, which is 200000 divided by 100. You multiply that 2,000 by the tax rate and you get your tax bill of 3,157. <coughs> so that's if you're not paying based on income, that's if you're just paying solely as a resident of Middlebury based on the value of your property. However, some complexity is added uh, when we take income sensitivity into account. So not everyone pays based on their property value. Actually, the majority of people at least get some form of property rebate adjustment. So this is a similar situation, but we're assuming it's a couple with $80,000 in income, which is below the threshold that's needed to receive a property adjustment. So the income yield serves the same purpose as the property yield. You divide your Ed's Benning Creek wise people by that number, and then multiply it by 2%, part of the funding formula, to get a new percentage of 2.67%. And then you multiply that number by the income, and that's what the tax bill will be, 2136. So you'll receive an adjustment on your tax bill for the difference of what you would have paid based on your property value versus what you should be paying based on your income sensitivity. And in FY17, most of our residents receive some form of property tax reduction. So between 63% and 77% receive some form of property tax adjustment. And then this is the warning, just to show you what it looks like. Um, this is legally prescribed in statute, so it's a little wordy, it's a little verbose, but these are the things that, required to, that we are required to warn, and this is the way in which we're required to warn them. So we tell you our total expenditures and our education spending for equalized people, as well as the change from the current year in Article 1. Article 2 is the transfer of our FY18 time fund balance to capital reserves. And then Article 3 is election of state directors. Questions? Could someone speak to the curriculum um, budget and 
the increase that we're seeing there. I'm reading the narrative in the report, um, so I have some sense of that. But if you could just speak to that a little bit and, um, and maybe say a little bit more about what the technology innovation specialists would be doing. Sure, so I can, I'll, I'll leave the job, the technology innovation specialist to others, but I can speak to the, um, the budget increase. So it's just a shifting of where positions are budgeted. So previously, uh, there are two positions that were budgeted elsewhere, so partially in technology and partially in student instruction. So there are reductions in those areas, but you don't see a one-to-one -one because the student instruction budget is so much larger. So it takes much more to move that marker percentage-wise than it does um, the curriculum portion, which is you know three or four hundred thousand dollars. So it's just a movement of existing positions to a new portion of, uh, to a different place in the budget to more closely align with what they're actually doing. And then I don't know yep. if you want to. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so the the tech innovation specialist is a position we had last year we had budgeted for this year so it, it, it was in this year's budget um, we were not able to fill that position the person in that position left at the end of last year so we weren't able to fill it so it's a continuation of a position that we started two years ago and that that role is working both in special education and district-wide to work both with the technology department but really looking from the curricular side at supporting uh, you know greater digital learning helping teachers to understand how to use technology to to really leverage technology to improve teaching and learning okay. and, and it's it's a position that's pretty common across most school districts um, it's not something we had had up until three years ago and I think if you t talk to any of the, the teachers that worked with the tech innovation specialists they'll say it was it was pretty impactful um, and, and there are you know I think people's facility with technology is really varied across the district um, in the same way that it, it is in the community some people get onto a computer and know how to do everything and some are are more comfortable with with paper for example um, so so it, it's been really helpful to bring everybody together to look at how to use technology not as a, a cool shiny thing to look at but how to support instruction which is really kind of the, the end goal and learning thank you uh, you mentioned a, a transfer of funds into the capital reserve uh, can you review what the numbers are, where the money comes from, Sure. what the numbers are, and what the purpose of that transfer is? So the transfer to reserve comes from our prior year surplus. So that means that we spent $123,801 less than what was budgeted. And so that money has to go somewhere, and we're required to separately warn the use of what we call our fund balance. Um, in the private sector, that might be referred to as retained earnings. And so there are three places for it to go. And the capital, uh, the capital project, excuse me, the capital fund is probably most in need of that transfer. Um, we know that we have some substantial um, capital projects, you know, uh, coming up. We don't know exactly what those are in some cases. Um, this year, some of that was used for um, school security upgrades. Um, HVAC upgrades. Um, it's, this year it was used for deferred maintenance primarily. Uh, that will be, the use of the capital projects fund would be presented to the board and approved by the board. And that has not yet been done for next year. But that, that reserve fund, I mean, they're also budgeted capital funds. Yes. Okay. Yes, yeah, so there's regularly budgeted facilities and that is mainly just uh, historically been our day-to-day -day operations, just sort of what it takes to keep the district going. And the Capital Projects Fund is more for larger scale projects and can also be for large unanticipated expenditures. One, one thing to add too is, I, if you look at our list, our current list out of our, we had a, an audit done three years ago of all of our facilities, which, um, showed us that and there was a you may have seen it in the newspaper there was a, a big article on on the the price tag of what it would cost to bring everything up to level 
we have a list of, of facilities needs and capital needs right now that we're we're kind of looking at and we're looking at the reserve and wanting to be you know fairly um, conservative in how we spend that because we want to have some saved in case something comes up that we need to act right away uh, we aren't taking care of all of the the facilities needs that we currently have whether it's you know paving at the high school um, you know things that that really kind of need to be taken care of that we can get by a year or two we're going to get by for a few more years just and, and try to save a little bit of those funds in case something you know a hundred or two hundred thousand dollar item we recently had a an elevator that broke that was you know sixty seventy thousand dollars just like that so it's it's important to have a little bit of that reserve in case those kinds of things happen um, some of the larger needs that we have as a district in terms of bringing our our buildings up to 2019 uh, require much more than we could budget in a single year and so that's that's probably something that will will flow out of the facilities master plan okay. i'm just going to comment that typically when you transfer funds to the capital um, reserve then they can be carried over from year to year yes uh, could you please clarify about the property tax yield like what that is exactly and how it's determined <laughs> oh, we, we had this conversation before a little um, it's largely a reflection of property value statewide so the tax commissioner rep, uh, recommends it and the, probably the simplest way to explain it is that at statewide they figure out how much money needs to be raised for education statewide and then they kind of force that number that's probably the easiest way to describe it but it is partially a value of um, real estate state uh, real estate values statewide we have a statewide funding system okay. and then the legislature acts on um, the tax commissioner's recommendation in the spring so is it sort of like how much tax they need to derive from each property in the state in order to fund all the schools is that what it means yes that we have yep. a statewide funding system yeah yeah Okay, thanks. I just had a question. The transportation graph is fascinating. Yes. Uh, that's a huge increase. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, okay. I, I was noticing that in the, in the explanation, um, you know, we put the contract out for bids and, and, you know, we got one. It's hard to have a strong negotiating position when you have, you know, one, one service provider. Is there any, um, is there any future thought you know is there any wiggle room in the future in terms of either negotiating that differently or having competition for it yeah because that's i mean that's a humongous increase yes in yeah period. so we have these conversations at the board level at length um you know in the i guess it was the summer before school started um, so there is room in that contract to renegotiate routes and to consolidate routes we're undergoing a transportation audit to determine if what we're doing is the most is the most effective. You know, now we're a single district. We can we can cross town. We can cross town lines. Um, so there is you know the school district. This is a problem in Vermont. School districts in Vermont have a hard time getting. Um, so if they run it themselves, they have a hard time getting drivers. And if they go out to bid, they have a hard time getting bids. So there's not a lot of players in the game. If any of you want to start a transportation company, <laughs> this is to get into. Um, but yes, there is there is room, so we're not locked into that number, and we're actively searching for solutions to try and reduce that over time. Which is the reason why um, we sort of put off a large increase in the coming year. We were, we were able to funnel that out a little bit, and so we know it's coming, and it gives us a little time to address it, perhaps through the facilities master plan as part of that process. I just wanted to speak to the transportation conversation too. I serve on the Adams I'm sorry, County I feel like Transit Resources Board, and I know that every now and then people pine for you know efficiencies related to public transportation. And either one way or the other, could we use public transportation to transport more students, or could we get uh, school buses to transport adults as well? You know, and I don't know if, if you're exploring those conversations too, or what those are, but. Yeah, I think it's important to have those conversations, especially as we're looking at the climate future and we're trying to encourage people to not use single occupant <coughs> cars as much. Um, so it makes sense to me. So that's one thing. 
And then I also think about other things related to transportation that I don't see reflected in the budget, you know, which are small relative to the cost of buses, and that's bike racks. You know, and you have you actually have more students that are riding to school on bikes and you don't have enough bike parking for those students plus adults that might want to use it. And I'm talking about really better quality bike racks and well placed and weather protected if possible, you know, with some kind of awning or shelter over them. So there's that and then we talk about the electric electrification of fleets, so that will happen with buses but also cars. So I know that another Amenity is like having a quick charger on site is maybe one or two and I don't know if you're thinking about things like that and There are grants coming for that. So I'm just mentioning that you know as something for the board to think about As you go into your future conversations around transportation just to think a little bit more than buses Thank you So uh, I have a bias as a cyclist I would love to talk about uh, bike racks and, and what you've noticed you know, across our schools, because I, I mean, I, have, I, have, I haven't heard much about that need. It's great to hear that there is that need. Love to, to talk more about that. In terms of partnering and looking at ways to reduce our fleet of school buses, we have um, looked at that. We have met with Actor to see if there are ways to, to create efficiencies. Um, we weren't able to have Actor cover enough of, of the coverage area that we had to make Actor replace one of our buses. We did kind of look at that and work with them and talk with them to try to, to make that happen. Um, we did find some efficiencies in working with Betcha to reduce a bus recently um, through looking at all of our routes and, and looking at student ridership. And we, we did reduce a bus a couple months ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that this audit will help too in looking at this as one one community as opposed to you know all of these these transportation routes were established with single districts and picked up students in a very different way so i think as we move forward we're going to get this data this year um, it's in process right now so hopefully that will help too and then you know i think a as we go forward we'll, we'll continue to work to to find those efficiencies and uh, you know one of, one of the things that, one of our lenses that is really important though as well is we have oversight over students on a school bus, they're in loco parentis at that point. So that, that's a significant responsibility of the school district that we have to also weigh as we're looking at options for how students get to school. What about adults riding on buses? That's kind of what I'm talking about. If, if, if adults were riding on school buses, then that, that shifts we're, we're responsible for students on that bus. It's not a public bus. Um, so it, it, that would be a lens that we would have to use to look at that as an option. <coughs> Questions with Brittany? Sorry, I'm always standing in front of me. Peter? S stand in front of me. Okay. <laughs> I know you're there, Peter. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not trying to hide. I just I want everyone else to see. I good bike, but you can't hide. I will say that uh, Brittany came on board, uh, and the second day on board, we got the contract for the bus. And she negotiated and worked very hard, so she got thrown into fire immediately uh, under a great deal of stress, and she did a terrific job. That is a that graph. We all responded to that in the same way, but that was a negotiation that she carried out. So I congratulate her on that because otherwise the number would have been substantially higher for this year, not leaving us any time to be able to uh, figure, figure out, out either in the big picture or the small pictures as to how we could become more efficient, which is written into the contract. So I congratulate our business manager for uh, having to take that on almost the, day, the moment she walked in the door. So. Welcome, Brittany. <laughs> 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 Al? Thank you, sir. Uh, can somebody just very briefly describe the overall uh, provisions for building security and if, if they vary from school to school or town to town? Uh, do you have any concerns, et cetera? So we, uh, we're continue, we continue to work on all of our buildings. and the. 
our buildings were all built with different architectural designs in different time periods. So I would say that each one of our buildings is unique and we work to support each building and, and make it as safe and as, um, as strong and secure as possible um, based on its design. Uh, recently we got a grant from the state and we have put um, cameras and locks at the front door so that um, you know previously some schools had those those um, things and some some schools didn't so we've we've um, ha we now have that in every school uh, we have put in for example at mums recently we put in a new wall so when you walk into mums you used to walk right into the school and now you walk in and you have to go through the office um, so we're continuing to make improvements to to all of our schools to make them safer um, a lot of what makes schools safe as well is 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 our protocols and how how students and faculty and community act within those buildings and and that's other work that we're really focused on right now um, we're partnering with sandy hook promise to to bring say something to acsd which is a, a program to to really encourage students to talk when they see something kind of strange to to talk to an adult about it um, and it's been proven to be really effective um, we're also, um, you know, we're also coming out of an incident at Moms um, in December, which was really startling for all of us. And we're continuing to come together both as a ACSD safety committee in our schools at Moms, and are working on an event for the community as well to look at safety and kind of build from that experience and move forward. Do you have law enforcement officers in some places and not in other places? So we have an SRO currently, it's a partnership SRO, school resource officer, yeah. uh, that's been in place for at least 10 years. Bill, how long is it? Since 2003. 2003. At every school? Uh, no, at, in Middlebury. It's a partnership with Middlebury Police. Uh, we would like to see that increase to, to our other schools. Um, currently, the, the funding is not there for the um, for the sheriff's department or you know state police to to do that they were looking at a grant to see if they could at least kickstart something like that and that's something that we're hoping to continue to work on uh, we do have that sro support if something significant is happening um, in a in a school outside of middlebury the sro can still be a part of that so it's not that um, strictly limited to middlebury but primarily in middlebury uh, most school resource officers spend their time across the country in high schools. That's, that's kind of where most of the kind of quote unquote action is. So that, that is, I think, mirrored here as well. Um, it, it tends to be, you know, probably 60% of time in high school and then rest of the time middle school and, and elementary school. And, and a big part of that is being proactive and, and working with the communities. It's, it's not really about enforcement, it's about working together to create a safe space. Thank you. I just want to say that I appreciate your letter, Peter, and today's Addison <coughs> Independent summarizing everything that you just said. It was very well articulated and summarized, so thank you for that. Oh, yeah. I didn't know it was in there. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. International baccalaureate curriculum, is there any um, intention to educate the public about it? I mean, we know it's there, it's been there for a while, and we read about it in here and so forth, but the details in a more comprehensive way, is that on the program or happening and I missed it? Or <laughs> it's always on the program. Um, how do you do love it? To, to would love to talk with you about how you think it would be great for us to, to educate and and be with the community to talk about it we, we've put on a number of events we continue to put on events both for you know for example ninth graders going into 10th grade or that's um, for parents yeah for parents okay. um, we, we have had some community events they haven't been as as well attended as we'd like but I went to it, a couple of those a year ago but I yeah. haven't seen anything since yeah I, 
Let's connect afterwards, and I'd, I'd love to hear. Maybe if you publicize other, other writings. That I, I went online and found a couple, but they're mostly bombastic stuff. Have you? Have you <laughs> I mean, they're promoting it. They want to sell it. Yeah, yeah. So, well, if you go onto Ivy's website, it, it, of course, it's going to speak that way. Um, I, I think there's a lot of great information that we've recently put on our website, and I don't know if you've spent time under the Ivy link <coughs> on our website. Yeah. That has a lot that of information. A lot of yeah, a lot of information specific to us too. It's not just IV information, but it's also information the ones about. Ones for parents been well attended. Uh, yes, they have been. So there's. Yeah. A, you have a feeling that parents are getting a good idea of what's going on. I, I that's think that's so. I, I mean, I I think it's definitely in, the knowledge about it is increasing greatly. We are also just beginning the diploma program. This is the 11th and 12th grade program starting in September. Yeah. So, you know, as we get into and start, you know, go through the DP program for a year or two, then I think we're really going to be feeling stabilized. People will really understand it. Some, some of people wonder what it's going to be like and some of its projection about the future. We have to live it to know it. To some degree. To some degree. So maybe yeah. if you did things yeah. by communities, for example, so that yeah. as you move forward and have results and can show yeah. the public some yeah. of what's going on. Yeah. It's interesting. It's I was just going to um, add that um, in, I think it was mid-December, we held a meeting for 10th uh, grade parents because it's our current 10th graders who will be eligible for the diploma program next year and we had um, I believe in the vicinity of 80 uh, parents show up for, for that meeting and the whole DP program was um, explained at that time. That's not too many. That's yeah. good. That's, That's good for us. That's not very many out of 100. I'll take uh, it. To follow up on that, is there any plan to use this as a marketing tool for our, our school district and our, our town so that we can attract people, for example, people who are selling homes, if they understand what this is, they can talk to prospective um, buyers and the college could be using that as a recruitment tool for a faculty and so on. I mean, do you have a plan for, I mean, obviously you have to make sure that it, it's successful first, but. Well, I think it's, it's, I think it's already working in some ways. I, I have a lot of conversations with many different types of people. Um, both outside of the district and in the district and when people hear about what we're doing they're excited about it. it sounds exciting and they're impressed that we're working together at the the level that we are you know we're going to be when we become an ivy world district when we're authorized at the end of 2020 uh, with all of our programs all three we'll be number 10 in the country at, as a full ivy world district so that that i think is is really cool. Um, it, it shows a level of commitment, I think, as a community to education and to, you know, the, those learner profile traits that IB grounds every student in. So I, I think it's, it's attractive to lots of different kinds of, of people that are looking for a place to settle and they're looking in either in Addison County or, you know, in this kind of area. I, I think, I, I believe that Right now, today, we are a beacon in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, in terms of how we market as we go forward, I think that's that's something that we're we're talking about. Our leadership team talks about that. Our IB coordinators talk about that, and um, it's it's work that we can continue to get better at in terms of getting that word out. And how does this relate to the Hanover Career Center? If you have a student who's in the Hanover Career Center, are they also part of this? Or from our district? They, they are. So they, they're, they're, depending on what, what town they come from, if they're from ACSD or, for, or from Mount Abe or Addison Northwest, that changes it slightly. But students who go to ACSD are able to access both Career Center courses and IB courses. The Hannaford Career Center is also working on, on pursuing the career-related program for IB which would be just a perfect synergy. And there's been, we, we got a grant from the um, state this year 
where, where we've been working directly with Hannaford Career Center in a way that I don't think we have previously. It's been really exciting looking at that, that IB career related program, which is essentially looking at providing both access to the diploma program for students and access to career center pro, um, courses as well. Is that all four grades? Nine through 12? That's two grades. Why two? Why, Why two? The diploma program is, is grades 11 and 12, and then the, the middle years program is grades five or six through 10. At the Canterbury Career Center, nine The Career Center is, is pre-tech pre is grades nine and 10, but the Career Center primarily is a, an 11th and 12th grade program. And if you're a slow learner and learn, I mean, everybody, <coughs> we now know everybody learns differently. Yeah. And if you learn with your yeah. hands and not yeah. uh, with books in front of you, yeah. and you're in the ninth and tenth grade and you don't have alternative education anymore, what do you do? The, the, the work we're doing with the middle years program. With the what? Middle years program. Uh -huh. So that's what students, when a, a freshman enters MUHS. They're, Seven through eight or ten? Yeah. So the one, the one beautiful thing that's happened <coughs> is we've now connected the middle school and the high school together through the middle years program in a way that I've seen very few middle, middle schools and high schools connected. Um, generally, it's hard to connect those two things together, those two entities together. And you feel those students are being served with that? I mean, I, I don't think that's the only thing. I think there are, there are countless things that we do when a student is, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what you mean by a slow learner, but Different, um, learning different. I mean, you know, the school is built fundamentally, you know, 70 percent of the children learn reasonably within a spectrum. But right, there's another 25% right. that don't learn that way and they need special help. The, the, the focus, I, I think the constructivist focus of, of IB, of... That works for it? Is, it is, is focused on getting students to engage in learning from a place of what, what they care about. There's yeah. obviously content that they need to learn. Yeah. But it, we're, we're shifting from that traditional paradigm of teacher teaches at the, from the, the pulpit, so to speak, and students memorize, write down, you know, kind of what, what I probably experienced as a student many years ago. So that, that in and of itself is shifting dramatically right now. And so a ninth grade student coming in to the high school is is in a class where there are more questions asked of that student instead of requests to memorize something or remember something. Mm -hmm. So there's more inquiry, there's more focus on creativity and discovery and taking action. I so those that. are things that I think, just as a human, I think are more intrinsically interesting and appealing and make me want to learn more. So that I think that's, our focus is trying to increase that in our classes to get kids to engage that, that do want to work with their hands or that do learn differently. And like you said, all of us learn, learn differently. My impression is that the International Baccalaureate, the focus is just what you're saying. There's more of that, which is better for different kinds of learners. Do you feel it's working? Have you done enough already so you feel like all students are benefiting? I think we're in, I think we're in continual improvement and I think the, the, to me, the beauty of IB is it's good teaching. It's good practice. So it's not, it's not a revolutionary, you know, no one else has discovered it but us. It's, it's really good teaching. It's well-structured. It's got really good PD. It's something we can build on. It's something that we don't have to look next year to see, you know, go to a conference and come back and find a new thing to, to start looking at. It's something we can grow and build. Uh, and it's going to have a really powerful impact. So I think it's, it's making an impact now, and I think it's going to continue. And there's always work for us to do to get better. Would you feel 10 years out, you'd have a better? Sorry to take up all this time. Uh, thank you. Yeah. We've had some of those questions, Natalie, also, actually, so yes. in the process. So I mean, I yeah. think your questions are really well founded, but I don't think we can answer it quite yet completely. Uh, one of the questions I had relative to all students is what somebody said, I forget who sent that article on Chicago schools uh, about inner city schools um, 
and there's a, quite a few schools in, in Chicago school system that are IB, or at least part of them, uh, which to me was really encouraging because obviously an inner city school is different than an Addison County school in population, and uh, that seemed to be thriving in that setting too, at least from this article and a couple of articles. So questions like you had, it's not like we haven't ever asked those. We'll see. Uh, education is a constant experiment to some degree, so. It's frustrating when you read, when you, got, you get a book like the ones that I read, they, um, they emphasize the success for the really bright people and how much that has done for them in high school when they go on to college, which is fine, that's great, but we don't want to leave the others out. Sure. They're important too, and they often get turned off when they're about 13 or 14 years old, and then that ruins the rest of their lives. And so what we can do for them one-on-one -on -one is incredibly important. Their families are sometimes. So what we do in our school is very important. I thank, just, you. thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Yeah. I mean, I think good teachers do incorporate projects or hands-on uh, activities, and I've seen that in a lot of instruction. So I think that we would hope that there's more yeah. of that or a lot of that. You yeah. have your greenhouse. I think kids are employed there, and they're making uh, wooden shop projects, so they are using their hands right now as ninth and 10th graders. Hmm. Other questions of our board or administration on the budget related article tomorrow? Uh, not tomorrow, next week? <laughs> <laughs> well, the third article on the warning tomorrow is the election of school directors. We personally invite uh, those who are on the ballot to introduce themselves if they would like to and say a word. It's not required, but if you'd like to say hello, go ahead, please. This year, this year on Blueberry, I just hit the end of the row here, so um, there are five people running for this three slots. As uh, people may know or should know, we're all elected uh, at large across all the seven towns. So the Ripton people vote on the Middlebury people and, and vice versa. So. The only real, uh, I guess, race this year is in Newburgh where there are five of us running for three seats. Uh, I'm running for one of them, James Malcolm. And um, I think uh, right now we're in a real uh, exciting time, honestly, with changes. That's what drove me back to be on the board after being on it many years ago. And uh, I think with International Baccalaureate, which I've gotten more and more enthused about, and the facilities plan, I think this is a uh, good time to be in the board, and I, I would uh, like to continue on it. I, I guess I'm just in the row, so. Lorraine. I'm Lorraine Morse. Um, I've been serving on the boards in the Middlebury area for about 18 years. I've been on the Mary Hogan board, the high school board, now on this board. Um, I agree with Chip. It's a very exciting time right now, challenging time as well with our declining enrollments. and. I would welcome the opportunity to stay on and continue the work that we're doing at the moment. So, you'll consider voting for me. Thanks. Steve, Steve Orzek, uh, uh, also from Middlebury. Um, as a transplant to Vermont, I've only been here for about 10 years. Um, this has been incredibly an engaging process for me. Uh, I have enjoyed, as, as a former social <laughs> studies teacher, I have enjoyed the level of civic engagement that's been happening here in Vermont, and I have really um, enjoyed the work that I've done starting with the Red Consolidation Committee and that just kind of sucked me in and um, being an educator and a, a social studies person and this is this is like I don't know this is like manna um, <laughs> this is where I like being and um, I, I think I'm doing a reasonably good job of, of uh, trying to keep up with it um, finance uh, I taught personal finance when I was a teacher and um, I'm on the finance committee so I think I bring a lot of experience to that um, and I like to think that I uh, bring a, a perspective of the classroom teacher to the board, which I think is, uh, um, is, is a good thing to have. So I'd like to encourage you to uh, vote for me uh, to stay on board. Um, and uh, good luck to everyone that's running.
Hi, my name is Ryan Torres, and I live in uh, East Middlebury with my wife, Lillian, who actually went to school here, in the high school she grew up here in Middlebury. And my two children, I've got a son, Benjamin, who's over at Mom's, and my daughter, Samantha, who is in the first grade over at Hogan. And uh, you know, so I've got a personal interest in running for the school board. I want to make sure that my kids have an environment that's you know, safe, that really where they can thrive both uh, with their education, but also with, it, also with their health and their well-being. Um, and then I think I feel like I bring a lot of personal or work experience that I think would be beneficial to the board. So I've, you know, a lot of my career has been spent working with nonprofit organizations, with mission-driven organizations. And so, you know, I've done a lot of work around public health. So I've done childhood lead poisoning for prevention as an executive director down in Boston. I did childhood, childhood obesity work uh, with the Greater Burlington YMCA, um, and also statewide and up there. Also, I did chronic disease prevention work as well with the YMCA. Um, I currently work here uh, as a contractor with the Blueprint for Health, supporting all of the medical practices um, here in Madison County as well in Rutland to uh, increase the performance and to create better uh, medical homes for the patients that the, the practices serve. Um, I've served on a number of nonprofit boards. Um, I've done, you know, I've worked with the Vermont Community Foundation, I've worked for them for about five years um, and did some fundraising experience with fund fundraising and board management. And really, you know, I feel like, you know, most, again, most of my work has been mission driven. Um, and this is my opportunity I to give back to the community and to serve the community that I live in as well. So. Hi, uh, my name is Betsy Kappelman. Um, I'm a mother to three sons. Two are in, at Mary Hogan in the uh, sixth grade and fifth grade. And my youngest is at Mary Johnson. Um, my husband is a professor at Middlebury College. Um, I work as an administrative assistant at Middlebury College. Um, we've lived here in Middlebury, East Middlebury actually, since um, 2011. And I would love to bring some new ideas, some uh, diversity to the school board, um, and also to as an artist, I'm a musician as well. I feel like there's a lot that the arts can contribute to basically all fields of learning. Um, we can use the arts as a, as a way to um, get innovative ideas to, uh, in all fields, basically all fields of learning. And I hope to contribute, to give back to the community um, as a mother, as uh, resident and yeah, it's Jim, we got one one more. Oh, there's <laughs> 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 Hi, my name is Mary Collinane. Um, the Waybridge, currently the Waybridge representative, filling uh, the spot that was left uh, when Chris Eaton and his family. Uh, moved away from Waybridge. And so I've been on the board uh, filling that spot for the past few months, and it, it has been um, an honor to be able to do that. Uh, I have been in Waybridge now for going on my third year. I own Community Barn Ventures along with my business partner, Stacey Rainey, uh, and we have made a decision in our lives to find a way to give back to the community in which we live and work. I started off my career as a former teacher. Uh, then I went on <clears throat> to head up Microsoft's work in education innovation, and then was the chief content officer at Houghton Mifflin Harcourt Publishing Company. Uh, and but I never played the role, never had the opportunity to play the role of a school board member. Thinking about this from a policy perspective, and given the opportunities that we as a community have in front of us to fundamentally make a difference. Um, for every kid, regardless of the home that they walk into at night or the classroom that they walk into in the morning, is a unique opportunity for us. And so to be part of that as we think about that in the future is a pretty cool gig. Um, so while my name, I think, is the only one on the Waybridge one, check the box, that would be awesome. <laughs> I would really like to participate in the future, so thank you all very much. Can I say something? Sure. Um, I'm uh, 
from Ripton, and I used to be on the school board years ago. My children are all grown up. I'm still in Ripton. I went to school in Ripton. Um, and I just felt like it's time. I'm, I've kind of lost touch of this whole uh, new ACSD board um, and the whole different way of looking at things interest me and I'd like to, uh, I'd probably like to hear right in for the Ripon board. Well, tell us your name. Bonnie DeGray. Bonnie DeGray. <laughs> Thank you, Bonnie. Can I say something? Sure. I'm very encouraged to see a number of candidates running and those of you who are already on the board running again, that you're so committed. And uh, I really think that's very healthy. And I'm really glad to see that. And I hope that all of you will participate, whether you're elected to seat or not. You know, like, and that we know that we can contribute even by our attendance at board meetings. We have plenty of task force work or committee work to be done so we all can participate and learn. Other comments, questions? Anything else to before our information hearing? If not, then we'll stand adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.